Okay, so like all these videos, you need to have your own copy of the exam paper, or the IB will get snarky and might shut my channel down. What happened to my friend? So how many moles are required? All righty. So I've written out the equation. You've got moles, mass, and molar mass. I just like to put those in a grid underneath and fill in some boxes. So I've got 32 grams of sulfur dioxide. So I've got 32 grams of that. The molar mass of sulfur dioxide, well, it's 32 for the sulfur, 16 for an oxygen, 16 for the next one. So moles is mass over molar mass. So it's 32 over this and this and this. So that's 64. Oh, so I've got a half. I've got half a mole of sulfur dioxide. And it wants to know how many moles of iron four sulfide. I think they've got a strange chemical. It wants to know what this one is. So now we just do a simple ratio. Four is to, I don't know, as eight is to 0.5. Four is to, I don't know, as eight is to 0.5. So that gives my unknown uh, as 0 0.25. So question one is A. Okay, so question two, it was the most difficult question. Only 16% of the people got it right. And it was the least discriminating, which meant the smarty pants, the less gifted, it made no difference. No one could do it. It didn't differentiate well, uh, discriminate well, excuse me. So the trick to this is you've got to know that the pressure at the beginning and the volume at the beginning and the temperature at the beginning is the pressure at the end, the volume at the end, divided by the temperature at the end. You just got to put the numbers into this equation. It's even easier than that because it says the pressure is constant, so P is gone. All right, so the volume at the beginning is 10. The temperature at the beginning is 27. No, it's not. You got to convert to Kelvin by adding 273. The volume at the end is 9, and the temperature at the end, we don't know. That's the question. Alrighty, so I've got 10 times T2 by cross multiplication. So this times this is that times that. 10 T2s is nine times 300. So T2 is nine times 300 over 10, cancel those. So it's gonna be 270 Kelvin. Is that an answer? 270 Kelvin. Uh, no, it isn't, but we can convert that into minus 3 degrees C. So that's going to be 2A. That's correct, 2A. Question 3. Bromine reacts with metal. What's the relative atomic mass of the metal? Okay, I think I'm going to have to do some stoichiometry here. So I've got, oh, not magnesium. It's unknown metal M. Then it's going to react with some bromine, that's diatomic, don't forget that, to make MBr2. Okay, that's balanced. Let me put in the moles, mass, and molar mass. Moles, mass, molar mass. All right, and so this is what I want to find here, the molar mass of the metal. By filling in the boxes, I should be able to get there. So 16 grams of bromine, 16 grams of bromine. I know that the molar mass of bromine is 80 and 80. So here I've got 16 divided by 160. Oh, that's nice. I can do that in my head. That's 0.1. All right. So using uh, stoichiometric ratios, one bromine is to 0.1, as one metal M is also to 0.1. That's not so bad. The mass is given in the question, 5.2. So now I can work out the molar mass. So I always remember moles is mass over molar mass. So mass over moles is molar mass. So I've got 5.2 divided by 0.1. Oh, that's going to be 52. So what metal has a molar mass of 52? Oh, 
I don't even need to know. That's the answer, 52. So 3 is C. Next question. Four, it's a, just a simple concentration question. So the equation for concentration is moles over volume. So moles is also mass over molar mass, if you recall. Mass over molar mass and volume. All right, so let's put the numbers in. What's the mass? Okay, so the mass is 0 0.5 in the question. The molar mass is 84, given in the question. And the volume is 250. Ah, oh, don't forget, you've got to divide that by 1,000 to get it into decimeters cubed. So which answer is that? None of them. Okay, so we have to mess about with the numbers a bit. I can do this part in my head, 250 divided by 1,000. That's just uh, 0 0.250. That simplifies that. Is that one there? No. Okay, then I have to do a bit more. This divided by 84, I can fix that up by taking it down to the bottom and making it multiply by 84. There we go. That one's there. So that's 4B. Question five, emission spectrum. All righty, yep, just have to learn. The lines converge at high frequencies. So that one's good. Two, electrons transition, uh, ooh, electron transitions to N equals two give visible. Oh, I'm not so sure about that one. Uh, if it's going, uh, let's say that that's N equals one, N equals two, N equals three. It depends which way the electron's going. If it's going up to N equals two, that doesn't release uh, visible light. It absorbs energy. But if it's going down to N equals two, yep, that one releases visible light. Remember, down to N equals one is UV, big jump. Down to N equals two is visible, smaller jump. And down to N equals three is infrared. So I don't know about that. It's unclear. But let's try the third one. Lines are produced when electrons move from lower to higher energy levels. Nope, it's when they move from higher to lower energy levels, when they go from the higher ones down to the lower ones. That's where you get the lines. So that one's wrong. So one's definitely right and three's definitely wrong. Oh, so that's going to be A, 5A. It turns out the IB did like that one. Okay. Question six. What's true about those two iron ions? All right. So what I'll do is I'll just put at the bottom the protons, the neutrons, and electrons, and just work them out. So what's the missing number, the atomic number for iron? Let's scroll up. Atomic number for iron is 26. All righty. So let me put that 26 in. 26, 26. Okay, so protons are the small number, atomic number. Neutrons is the difference in the numbers, which in this case is 30. And in that case, it's 28. And the electrons, uh, well, this three plus doesn't mean that you've added three protons. No, that's madness. You've removed three electrons. So instead of having 26 electrons that a normal iron atom has, it's lost three of them. So it's only got 23 left. And by the similar logic, the one above, it's got 24 electrons left. All right, so what answer is that? They both have the same. Oh, all that maths for no reason. It's 6b. I wasted my time. I could have just, I could have just worked that out. They've got the same number of protons. They must do, because they're both iron. All iron ions or atoms have 26. That's one minute of my life. I won't get back again. Question seven. Which of these is acidic? Well, if you look at, if you look at the answers, it really hinges on this. If you can work out 
if one is not true, then it must be C. Well, this is sand, so there's no way that that dissolves in water. And aluminium oxide also doesn't dissolve in water. So if they don't dissolve in water, then the question makes no sense in terms of is it acidic? So this is wrong. And if that's wrong, it must be C, which means these must be right. And just to remember, acidic oxides are the non-metal oxides. So the non-metal oxides are acidic. I remember because there's sulfurs here and sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide are the acids in acid rain. Next question, eight, which requires the least energy for the removal of an electron. Well, how easy is it to pull an electron off? If something has a high charge, it's hard to pull off the electron. So if you've got a iron two plus and iron three plus, and you want to pull off an electron, it's going to be harder to pulling off that one because it's three plus. And also the further the electron is away from the pull of the nucleus, the easier it is. An electron here is going to be easier to pull off than an electron there, just because this one is further from the pull of the nucleus. All right, knowing that, let me write down the electron arrangements of these three ions. So it's 2, 8, 2, 8, 1, 2, 1, and 2, 8, 1. So to pull the electron off the least amount of energy, it's going to have to be magnesium plus or aluminium 2 plus because their valence electron is furthest from the pull of the nucleus. And is it easier to pull an electron off of a plus or off of a two plus? Well, it's easier to pull it off of a plus, isn't it? Because it's only got, only attracted to a plus as opposed to a two plus, less electrostatic attraction. So the answer is going to be 8B. For nine, the sulfite ion, so to try to work out the geometry of this, you've got to do the Lewis structure. So sulfur's in group 16, so it has six valence electrons. Oxygen is also in group 16 with six valence electrons. And there's an extra two electrons there. I need electron pairs. So I'm going to divide by two to get the pairs. So that gives me 13 electron pairs. The first element in the formula is sulfur, so almost certainly that goes in the middle, and space the other three evenly around. Join them up, but don't make a ring. Lovely, so I've used three electron pairs, 13 in total, so 10 more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Notice that every atom has four lines around it, four electron pairs stable octet. Alright, so looking at the central atom here, it has uh, four electron domains and one lone pair, which means it has to be a trigonal based pyramid. Oh, so it's that one. Let me just rush through the, uh, the drawings of the, the other ones. Next question. So another Lewis structure one. Chlorine is in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons, same for fluorine, and I have to take an electron off, that's why it's positive. I want pairs, divide by two, which gives me 10. Chlorine in the middle, because it's the first in the formula, Put the fluorines evenly around it. Join it up. I've got to have 10 lines, 10 electron pairs. I've put two in. I need eight more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the IB is kind of hoping that you'll think this is linear, but it isn't linear. The central, the central atom has four electron domains, two lone pairs. So that's going to be bent. Ah, so what's the question? It's got 
too lone and too bonding, so 10 is D. 10 is D. Question 11. The highest boiling point. Well, this is organic chemistry, so you're almost certainly looking for hydrogen bonds here. Which one of these has hydrogen bonds? And if you recall, uh, a compound can have a hydrogen bond if the hydrogen's bonded to the fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen. These three have very high electronegativities. So it's this one. I can see a nitrogen bonded to the hydrogen there. So that's going to have a high boiling point from hydrogen bonds. Let's just check the others for tricks. Ah, so they're trying to fool you into thinking that there's a O attached to an H there, because that's what it looks like. But that's not, that's not the case at all. This is an aldehyde. So if I was to draw out the aldehyde, you'd see that the hydrogen is not attached to the oxygen. It's actually attached to the carbon. So they're trying to distract you. So this is actually dipole-dipole. That's weaker than hydrogen bonds. So that's wrong. Again here, they're trying to convince you that the hydrogen is attached to the fluorine, which would mean hydrogen bond. But no, you've got to draw it out. The hydrogen is in fact attached to the carbon, not the fluorine. So again, this is just dipole-dipole, which is weaker than hydrogen bonds. And again, hydrogen to oxygen, same old trick. No, this is just an ether. The oxygen's attached to the carbon, not the hydrogen. So the answer is 11D. Question 12, which molecule's polar? Oh, I am all Lewis structures. Okay, so uh, beryllium dichloride looks like that. Beryllium's unusual. It can have a, it can be stable with four electrons or two electron pairs around it. So that's linear, so it doesn't have a dipole, not that one. BCL3, boron's unusual, it can be stable with six electrons, three pairs of electrons around the central atom. No, the bond dipoles cancel there, so it's not that one. Nitrogen trichloride, nitrogen's in group five, chlorine's in group seven. Divide by 2 is 21, it's 13. So, yeah, that's that one. The dipoles don't cancel here. Uh, nitrogen, chlorine, dipoles don't cancel. So, so it's that one. It's polar. 12C. 13 was the most discriminating. That's the one that the smarty pants get right and the less gifted don't get right. Let's see if I can get it right. So it's a Hess's law. So don't forget you have to manipulate these two equations to get them to equal this equation here. And you're allowed to flip them and you're allowed to double them and half them and triple them, la di da. So how can we get into this? I noticed that there's iron here and nowhere else in these two equations is there just iron on its own. And there's iron here. So I think that I have to flip this one to get the iron on the other side. And I'm going to need to double it as well. So I'm going to flip it and double it. So I've got 2FeO plus 2CO goes to 2Fe plus CO2. And that's going to be minus 11 because I flipped it, changed the sign if you flip it, and then I'm going to double it. So this is gone. Am I done? No, I don't think so. No, nope, maybe I am done. Yes, yes, I think I'm done. Oh, that wasn't too bad. So let's just double check. I've got 
two uglies here, two feos and two feos there. That's gone. Now I've got this. Yeah, makes that. Two carbon dioxides and one carbon dioxide makes three. Two carbon monoxides and one carbon monoxide makes three carbon monoxides. That works. Two ions makes two iron. And, ah, I forgot to put that two there when I was working out my second equation. I didn't double everything like I was supposed to. Yeah, that's all good. It all works out. So what do I have to do now to work out x, this unknown? You just sum what's above. So it's minus 3 plus minus 11 times 2. So what's that? Is that minus 25? Minus 25 is A, 13A. You have not discriminated against me, IB. <laughs> 14. Oh, looking at that equation, it's pretty chilly. You can see that delta H is positive, so that's endothermic, uh, which is cold. If it was negative, it's exothermic, which is hot. One of the less gifted students I used to teach, they used to remember it because there's an O in cold and an O in endo, and that's how they used to remember endo was cold. Yes, uh, the better way to remember it is endo is four letters, cold is four letters, exo is three letters, hot is three letters. Anyway, the reaction in question is endo, so it's going to be cold. So the temperature decreases. So it's either going to be C or D. And an endothermic energy profile looks like that. There's the reactants, there's the products. The products have higher energy than the reactants. So these are less stable. Anything with higher energy is going to be less stable. So what's that going to be? 14C. 14C. 15, the harbour process, one in three of you are alive today because of this process. We were going to run out of food, uh, but then ammonia can be used to make fertilisers. So we're not all starving. Bond energy calculations. Okay. So it says that to break the nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond is Y. And the hydrogen hydrogen single bond is X, and there's three of those. And there's six of these nitrogen hydrogen bonds here. Ammonia looks like that. And there's two of them. Okay. So that means there's six nitrogen hydrogen bonds to break. So that's six Z. Now, if you're breaking this, you're breaking it, you have to put energy in, so that's going to be endothermic. You're breaking this, you have to put energy in, so it's endothermic. And you're making these bonds, so it's going to be exothermic, releasing energy. So that's your answer, plus y, plus 3x, minus 6z. So that's c. Uh, there's another way to do it, which involves products minus reactants, but that's a bit confusing. I prefer my way of doing it. 16. Samples of sodium carbonate are reacted with that. Okay, so what's the same for reaction 1 and 2? So this is excess. I've always got enough hydrochloric acid for my experiment. But it's going to be two sorts of concentrations. You've got dilute hydrochloric acid, and then you've got more concentrated hydrochloric acid. I've got the same amount of this. So essentially, the reaction's going to be the same, except it's going to be slower. This is going to be slower, and that's going to be faster. Slower because there's less collisions per unit time. But they're both going to get to the end. They're both going to finish because I have enough 
hydrochloric acid to finish it's in excess so what have we got what's the same for the reactions the initial rate of reaction that's not the same so it's not the same because the dilute one is slower the total mass of carbon dioxide produced yep that's the answer 16b you might have to wait a little longer but you're still going to make the same amount for thoroughness the total reaction time no no the dilute one's going to take longer and d the average rate of production no 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 the dilute one's going to have a slower average rate of production so the answer is 16b 17 what decreases the activation energy so there's my energy diagram reactants and products what decreases the activation energy uh, it used to be that and now it's that so that's going to be a catalyst isn't it catalyst so 17 is b 18 a little bit of equilibrium theory Hmm. So it looks like as the temperature increases, Kc increases. As the temperature increases, Kc increases. And don't forget that Kc is a measure of the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So if Kc goes up, there's going to be more products, less reactants. That's going to get Kc to increase. So as you increase the temperature, this side's going to be favoured. The product side is going to be favoured. Alrighty, which statement is correct at higher temperatures? The forward reaction is favoured. Yeah, 18A, wallop. What are the bronsted lowry acids? Well, if it's equilibrium, there must be a bronsted Lowry acid on each side. And just to recap, a bronsted Lowry acid is a proton donor. And in this case, a proton is an H+. So of these four chemicals, two of them are giving away H pluses to work out which two, one on each side. Well, each chemical contains hydrogen, sometimes if it has no hydrogen, it couldn't give away an H+, but all of these contain hydrogen. But that's a common shortcut we can't use here. All right then, so to my eye, this H2PO4- has lost a hydrogen plus to become that. H2PO4-, minus. if I take off an H+, plus from that, I've now only got one hydrogen. And my charge is now 2-. minus. Yep, so this is the bronsted Lowry acid here. And on the product side, what's lost an H plus is the water. So the water. Water has lost an H plus. That goes to OH minus. Yep. So the answer is 19D. 19D. And 20, the second most discriminating. Acids and bases. All right, so let's look at the pH. Let's say they're the same concentration. Fair enough, that makes sense to me. So hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. You need to know hydrochloric, nitric, sulfuric acid are strong acids. So strong acids, so it's going to have a low pH. This is a strong base. You need to know that group one hydroxides are strong bases. So that's going to have a high pH. Is that enough to answer the question? Increasing pH. So this should be first, this should be last. Is that enough? It is enough. 20C. Nice. For completeness, this is a weak base, ammonia. It's the only one you really need to know. And this is a weak acid, ethanoic acid. You need to know that all organic acids are weak. 21, the most difficult question.
what's correct for this reaction. Well, you have to put the oxidation uh, states underneath to work it out. All elements have an oxidation state of zero. Hydrogen's plus one in a compound, oxygen's minus two in a compound. Uh, hydrogen is plus one in a compound, which means phosphorus plus, phosphorus must be minus three to get zero. And then this is plus one, plus one, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. It's got to equal minus one. So that's plus five, isn't it? Plus five. All right. Uh, but we're not finished. Now you have to see which oxidation state goes up, which oxidation state goes down. Well, hydrogen never changes, nor does oxygen. So it has to be phosphorus, doesn't it? Yeah. So this goes from zero to minus three. That's reduction, which means the P4 is the oxidizing agent. The oxidizing agent is itself reduced. And rather delightfully, this P4 goes to this P here. It goes from zero to plus five. So that's oxidation. Oxidation state goes up. And so it's also the reducing agent. So it's both P4, P4. 21 is D. 22. So electrons go around the external circuit, around the wire. So it has to be A or B. But I just don't know the answer to this one off the top of my head. I'm going to have to work it out from first principles. OK, so the voltaic cell that I do know is the Daniel cell. You should memorize this one. That's the one with zinc in a solution of zinc 2 plus ions and a rod of copper in a solution of copper 2 plus ions. It's a voltaic cell, so it's joined by a voltmeter, and nothing's going to happen unless you put the salt bridge in. <clears throat> so the equation for the cell is the zinc and the copper 2 plus goes to zinc 2 plus and copper. You have to memorize that and make your life easier. Uh, I just remember that the most reactive ends up as an iron. So I'm going to end up with zinc 2 plus, but then of course you have to know the zinc's more reactive than copper. Anyway, so once you've done that, you've got to work out where the electrons are going. Well, it looks like two electrons have gone from this zinc here. They've disappeared, haven't they? I've gone from oxidation state zero to oxidation state plus two. There's two electrons have gone missing. So the electrons have come off of here, going that way. Now the electrode that gives off the electrons is the negative electrode. So from the cathode, from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. Yeah, so the answer is B. That's quite a tricky one. I'm surprised that wasn't one of the more discriminating ones. 23, what represents reduction? Well, in IB, reduction has three definitions. So reduction, either the oxidation state is going down, that's reducing uh, the oxidation state, or you're adding hydrogen or removing oxygen. And this one here is the one almost always the IB is talking about. So let me put the oxidation states underneath. Oxygen's minus two in a compound, which means the sulfur's plus six. And it's all got to equal uh, minus two. So no oxidation state changed here for the sulfur or the oxygen. So A is wrong. For B, oxygen and a compound's minus two. So manganese is plus three. And then it seems to go to plus four. No, no. That's oxidation, not reduction. That's wrong. C contains one of the oxidation number tricks. Oxygen in H2O2 is minus one. So oxygen goes from minus one to minus two, that's reduction. So the answer is C. The other tricky uh, oxidation state you need to know is that if hydrogen is with a metal, it's not 
plus one like it normally is, that's wrong. It's actually minus one if it's with the metal directly bonded. Now this is the one I got wrong. I rushed through it on my first go. So purple to colorless. So they want to know uh, which of these will undergo oxidation. If you remember, primary alcohols, they undergo oxidation. Secondary alcohols, they undergo oxidation. And tertiary alcohols, they do not undergo this kind of chemical oxidation. So the question's asking you basically which are primary and which are secondary. This is primary, I can tell. Find the OH, find the carbon it's attached to. How many carbons directly attached to it? Just one, it's primary. So that one's good. For this one down here, find the OH, find the carbon attached to it. How many carbons directly attached to that? Just one. So that's primary. So it's one and two. Is that enough? No. And for the last one, find the OH, find the carbon attached to it. How many carbons directly attached to that? Is one, two. So this is a secondary alcohol. That's also good. So it's one, two, and three. 24D. Twenty-five boiling points. Uh, ooh. Well, I just remember sticky sausage, non-sticky balls. So, whichever of these isomers is the more sausagey, that's the one that's going to be stickier, and it's going to have a higher boiling point. And whichever of these isomers are more spherical, it's going to have the lower boiling point. So I've got pentane, I've got 2-methylbutane, and 2,2-dimethylpropane. That's kind of sausagey, that's kind of spheric, and that's somewhere in between. Alrighty, so increasing boiling point, so lowest first. So this is the first one, the lowest boiling point. That's second, and that's third. So what does that correspond to? B. 25 is B. The more surface area a molecule has, the more London dispersion forces, and the higher the boiling point. The lower the surface area, the less London dispersion forces, and the lower the boiling point. 26 is about benzene. I've never seen benzene in my life. I've been doing this for 32 years. So benzene doesn't undergo addition. It undergoes substitution. This ring is very strong. It's hard to break it using chemistry. So A is wrong. Only does substitution. B, alternate single and double bonds. And it's planar. Mm, I'm not sure about that. If you use this model, it doesn't have alternate single and double bonds. It has one and a half bonds all the way around, on average. And if you use this model, then it does have it does have single and double alternate carbon carbon bonds. So that depends on what model they're talking about. I don't know the answer to that one. Might be right, might not be. Let's look at the others. C. Six signals in an H1 NMR. No, that's not true. Every hydrogen is in an identical environment doesn't matter which uh, model you use. Every hydrogen's the same all the way round. So C's wrong. D, there's one signal, yep, and it forms a single isomer of that. So there's my benzene. Does it matter if the bromine is here? Or here, is there only one isomer? Or does it matter if it's here? No, it doesn't matter, they're all the same. So that one's correct. D, 26D. And so that must mean the IB wasn't talking about this model here. 
with the single and double carbon carbon bonds. Okay, 27. Okay, so anything with two oxygens in is going to be an ester or a carboxylic acid. So since these two oxygens are in the middle, this is going to be an ester. A couple of ways you could go about this. Uh, you could try and work out the name and work it out from there. So let's do that. To, in order to name an ester, you've got to find uh, the bond where the carbon and the oxygen is. And I want the carbon and I want the oxygens to be on one side. So somewhere in the molecule that will uniquely be identified. There's a bond between a carbon and an oxygen with both oxygens on one side. And so that's here. That's where that bond is there. So I imagine that that's where it's cut. This is going to be the carboxylic acid. That's the carboxylic acid, which is used to make the ester, two oxygens. And so I count four carbons, so that's going to be butanoic acid. That smells terrible. Uh, so it's C or D is the answer. C or D. Now looking at this, hmm. well, here's the other strategy that you could use. Is when you mix the carboxylic acid with the alcohol, water is removed. It's a condensation reaction, but water is removed. So if I put the water back in again, that should regenerate the, the reactants. So I'm going to put the water back in again. Split the molecule there and put the water back. Okay, so I'll put hydrogen there and OH there. Hmm. So when you react these together, uh, this comes away and they bond. But I've just done it in reverse. So what's the name of this alcohol here? Uh, ooh, I have to draw it out. C O H H C H three C H three. Okay. So that's a uh, propen two ol. Oof, that was tricky. So that's D. Twenty seven is D. Hmm. Nearly done which is correct for the spectra of organic compounds. So let's have a look. A, mass spectroscopy is bond vibrations. No, nope, bond vibrations is infrared. That's wrong. B, H1 NMR tells you about carbon hydrogen bond lengths. No, no, no. Carbon hydrogen bond lengths. Pff, not really sure what the IB would say for that. Maybe crystal, X-ray crystallography. But H1 NMR looks for hydrogen environments. So that one's wrong. C, infrared, provides a number of hydrogen atoms. Nope. Hydrogen atoms is H1 NMR. So it must be D, whatever D is. Mass spectrometry provides information about the structure. I'm not too happy about that one either, but that's the right answer. Don't forget, mass spectrometry takes a molecule, gives it a charge, and then cuts it into pieces. You can kind of work out, oh, is it... There's a 15, it's a methyl plus, or if it's an OH plus, it's 17. Remember all that? Right, 28D. 29, 2-methyl butane. Just draw that out. There's butane. There's the methyl. And put in the hydrogens, because that's what H1 NMR measures. In hospitals, they don't call them NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, because the word nuclear scares people. We call them MRI. Of course, it's the nucleus of hydrogen atoms. It's in water. It's not that scary. All right. Well, that looks like a mass spectrum. It's meant to just be a dividing line. Idiot. Alrighty, so let's count up the number of hydrogen environments that we have. The ratio of areas up there. Okay. So that's one hydrogen environment. So that has an area of three. Which 
which is of course the same as this one. So that three should really be a six. So six of those hydrogens are the same. Now this is the one that looks, they're thinking that you might miss. There's just one hydrogen like that. So there's a little peak of a one. These two are different from everything else. So a cheeky peak of two. And then finally, these three are different. So a cheeky peak of three. It's important to know that these three are different to these three, even though they're at the end of the molecule. They're slightly, slightly different. The machine's that good. It knows that these three here are close to the branch, and that these three here are slightly further from the branch. I mean, the, the peaks are going to be close, but it's that good, the machine. Six, one, two, three. So that's 29A. A. And the final one. 30. Absolute and percentage uncertainties. All righty. So let's do the maths first of all. Do I need to do the maths? Yes, I do. So this is going to be a 20.00. Now you have to add the uncertainties here and here to get the uncertainty for the total. So that's going to be plus or minus 0.1. Is that enough? No, that just narrows it down to B or D. And the percentage uncertainty, well, that's just the absolute uncertainty on the top of the, the value that you calculated times 100. So what have we got here? So that's 10 over 20, so that's a half. That's half a percent. So that's going to be B, 30B. And we're done.